last time with uh, doing an if statement here. Uh, and we ran into an issue last time, I'm trying to get my little share uh, screen thing to go away so I can actually view what's going on. And I believe the issue was that this was all in text. I think that is why it was doing uh, what it was doing. I'm gonna clear this. Is this the scripture lecture? Yes. So we're continuing from the last one. I'm gonna bring it up in a second. Uh, I don't know if you all remember, I was trying to figure out what was going on with this because it kept listing the formula, but it wasn't actually evaluating it. So we left off on scripture lecture 2A and we were working with uh, count if. So we did this first part of objective three, we did the count if. Uh, and the way that worked was here. Uh, we did, we had it count if, so it means it was going to keep count of uh, everything from E14 to E78 that had water sports in it. So we had 10 items that showed up here. Um, so if we actually were to scroll through here, we would count water sports 10 times. Um, and that's where we left off. The next thing we were doing was working with the inventory level. And I was showing you all another logical function that you can use. So let's see. Uh, and that's where we ran some issues. And I was honestly not able to figure out why it was doing that. Just now I've had a thought that maybe it was how it was formatted. Uh, it might've got stuck in text. So let's see if it works now that I cleared its formatting completely. So um, the if function, the way it works is that you just do, the way it works is that you do uh, if for if, in my parentheses here. The first thing you want to do is have a logical test. So a way to test to see if um, something is going to be true or false. Um, if it's true, you'll tell it what to do. If it's false, you'll tell it what to do. Um, in this case, so we're talking about inventory. We want to talk about how many items that we should keep um, or if we need to order more. This is our way of being able to test that. So we're going to look at how many items we have on hand currently, so the quantity on hand. I'm going to compare that to the number five. If we have less than five items on hand, we should order more. Otherwise, we should be okay. So we have four or less, then we need to do something about it. Um, and so with any logical test, there's always some type of comparison operator. Um, so you can compare things with um, less than, with greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Um, and those would just literally be like putting an equals after the sign. So like this, come on, if I know I wasn't done yet. Um, it would be like that. That would be less than or equal to you. Um, there's also a way to test to see if two things are equal or if they're not equal as well. Uh, so after that, if you don't put anything, let's make sure this is working now. Follow with the formula. First character is it equals. Okay, I think this is the formula. Why is it still hmm. I'm trying to well I am typing a formula. Not taking my formula. It's really strange. So uh, you guys do it on yours. I want to know if yours is coming up with an error as well for when you do it. I didn't even click that at time. You all let me know if you are getting an error. Mine is with error as well, okay. I wonder did they change the way that this is done in an update? I would expect not. I'm gonna do something crazy here. That, that's not even taking it. equals, okay, so that part is working, equals F, 
All right, I know I'm gonna do this just a different way. I'm gonna try it through formulas to see if this is gonna cause an issue still. Logical tests, A14, less than five, value of true, reorder, value of false. Okay, let's see if it messes up now. Okay, that was really weird. So I'm gonna go in here. Notice how it's the same thing that we typed before. I wanna see if that happens again if I type it. Um, less than five, comma, reorder, comma, okay. Okay, so now it works. All right, that was strange. Um, yeah, we just typed the same thing. So. Um, I honestly do not know why it decided not to work and then all of a sudden now it wanted to work today. So I'm glad it did. So those of you that if you still if you got an error uh, like I did before. What I did was I, I did it through the formulas uh, tab so that it would um, use the wizard to do it. So I was type, pretty much typing in the exact same thing except now Excel is placing everything in here. So I did that to see if it still got the same error. Because the error that it was getting wasn't even an error. It was just only, um, it was taking this calculation as itself. So this is what was appearing in the cell. The only time that ever happens is if there's a quote in front of here to let Excel know not to actually evaluate this. There was no quote in front of that, as you all saw. And those of you that, since this is being recorded, you can go back and take a look at that yourself uh, to see that it wasn't. Um, so. I just happenstance decided to go with the formulas and have Excel forcefully put it in just to see if it was still going to give the error. Thankfully, that actually seemed to fix it. So if you are having that issue on your end, um, I'll show you what I did. I'll do it again. I went to the formulas tab, which I showed you all previously. It has all of the formulas, or sorry, all the functions that are uh, within Excel that are pre-built in, in this function library um, group. I went to the logical one. Selected if. So these are the same uh, parameters that we had when we were typing it in. It just allows you to type the stuff in in a wizard format and an Excel will put it in for you. And so we had to have uh, A14 less than five. You'll notice it'll even start telling you what it's going to give you an answer result of. So that's going to be false. Then it's, if the value was true, we did reorder. Notice I'm not putting the quotes around it here it automatically will put those quotes there for you you have to put the quotes um you have to put the quotes in and if you're typing it directly if you're using a wizard you don't have to put the quotations around it because they'll do it automatically for you okay and then do okay as your last part um, then you would click okay and it would place it in there so i already have it so i didn't want to do it twice uh, and so there's my there's my uh formula already answered in. Okay. So if you guys ever run into any issues like what you saw here where you you know you're testing correctly and you can't seem to figure out what's going on, uh let me know. Like send me the file and I'll take a look at it as well. Uh I don't want you all to go through this as as like we did. Um because we just spent honestly last week it was about five minutes and then today as well. We spent about 10 minutes doing it, so about 15 minutes trying to see what was wrong with it, not allowing us to work and have why that happened. So I'm gonna do, go ahead and do a fill handle down to uh, F78 for this. And now we have a quick way to look to see if we need to order or reorder things. The part about this is, you know, as more people buy this stuff, you know, if this number went down to three all of a sudden, I wouldn't have to worry about going back in evaluating this inventory formula so don't do this at home uh, i'm just showing you what it's going to look like so if i made this all of a sudden that automatically changed to reorder so i never have to worry about oh i guess i should do these calculations again it's automatically in there and so just this changing of uh finding on hand will automatically change this for me and this is the best way to use this like as well so that way you don't personally have to worry about. um Making these changes. 
You don't have to worry about doing recalculations. It's automatically done. Okay. Uh, like for instance, let's say that you have your box uh, box board distribution person or your restock person uh, ha had access to this list. They will automatically see this update every time this updated. So they never had to worry about going to check themselves to do we have enough quantities on hand. Every time you sell something, this part could automatically subtract one from it. Uh, you can set this up to automate in that way. Okay. All right. So any questions about the F function? Or about the error that it was giving us before, and or not error, but the fact that it wasn't working correctly before, how we fixed it. No. Okay. Cool. Uh, Sandra, did yours gets fixed as well? Yeah, I used the I used the uh, wizard for the function. So I was already using a function before, but now I use the wizard. So uh, that way you can just type things in there and Excel pulls that information and creates the formula for you. So that was how I quote unquote fixed it. Yeah, uh, are you, wait, so you wouldn't, yeah, I'll walk through it again. So you technically, sh this should never happen to you. I hope it never happens to you, uh, but this is what I did. So the error issue was we were trying to type this stuff in Reorder. Reorder. Okay. And it wasn't letting us. Well, it let us, but it kept leaving it as this. So as you can see now, it's working perfectly fine. But so what my brain did was to in order to try to fix this, I said, okay, I'll make Excel do it for me by going to the formulas tab in the function library group. This is where all your functions are. And so I'm gonna go to the logical command and select if, because it's a logical function. And now I'm gonna type in those things that we were asked to type into it. So the logical test was uh, A4, A14 is less than five. The value of true was reorder. The value of false was okay. And so you also can see as you move through typing this stuff in, the wizard gives you the result. So the final result is going to be okay because it saw this is false. This is what will happen if it's true. This is what happens if it's false. Since it was false, it's going to give us okay. And so the using the wizard also can help because while you're typing things in, you do see what's happening as you move through. Um, and it helps, it helps a lot of people say, okay, I know this is the correct function because this is what I expect to happen, as opposed to doing it the other way you only see the result. This one, you kind of can walk, walk through it. And so formula result will be okay. Okay. So that was the, that was the, that's all I did. So that was just those, uh, you, sh you should be able to type it in. As you can see now, typing it is working. It was not working before, but if you ever have an issue with typing it in, you should be able to go to um, the formulas tab and use the, use the command within function library to find it. Um, if you're not sure which one of these the function is under, I showed you all this before. You can use insert function. So, so and that's because I already have something in here. Let's see if I can get this to automate. Yeah. So I could search for it. So I wasn't sure what it was. I know it's a, it's called if. I can go here. Oh, that must be the one that I was looking for. So you could search for it if you didn't know where it was. Okay. Did that help, Tabitha? Yes. Okay, cool. Sweet. All right. So now you're welcome. That's what I'm here for. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to set this up because, yes, it says okay in reorder, but wouldn't it be nice to have some colors that pop out at you so you could very visu uh, visually see that you need to reorder something or stuff is okay? Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to select uh, F14 up to F78. I did it using the name box because I didn't want to scroll all the way down. And I am going to do what's known as conditional formatting. 
So I'm going to go back to the Home tab. You all know that formatting has to do with the font, um, the back, which has to do with, you know, if it's bold or not, what type of font you use, the size it is, the borders around it, um, the background color, the font color. Um, there's other things too, like having it be strike through and all this stuff. That's what formatting is. Conditional formatting is formatting based off of certain conditions. So what we're going to do is we are going to um, use conditional formatting to um, make these cells kind of pop out so we can really see if something re needs to be reordered or not, uh, or if it's okay. We can do things, we can make changes to its format using conditional formatting so that'll be easier for us to spot. And so uh, there are a couple of different ones here. We're gonna, we're gonna look at today uh, data bars. We're also gonna look at highlight cell rules. Um, but to use highlight cell rules, uh, what it is is it's saying whatever's in the cell, we're gonna use these rules to decide how to format it. So you notice you have a greater than here, a less than, a between, an equal to, a text contains, a date occurring, or if things are duplicate. And there are more rules too. You can create your own rules as well. For the purpose of this uh, problem, what we're going to do is we're going to use text that contains because this is all text. So I'm going to do text that contains. And so it says format cells that contain the text and format the ones that say reorder. You notice that as I began to type, what happened, you get a little preview in the background of, of it kind of changing its format already. Um, and that even goes as far as like, if I just type the letter O in, because all of these have an O in it, that happened. If I type the letter K in, only the OKs would have it. But if I type the letter R, all the ones reorder happen. But I'm gonna type out the whole word reorder. So it, just in case there was ever something else that said maybe re-re or something, I don't know. Um, I don't go straight clicking OK, though. What I want to do is I want to choose the format that it has. So there are some predefined uh, ones. Light red fill with dark red text. Yellow fill with dark yellow text. Green fill with dark green text. And you'll notice there's this common theme with red, yellow, and green, um, kind of like with your traffic lights. Red means stop. So something's really important you need to watch out. Uh, yellow means you need to slow down, so maybe kind of cautionary. You pay attention to it. Green, you just keep going. You don't even worry about it. So these are often used um, in that same regard. So if something's really important that you need to watch out for, you would usually format it in red, yellow for things that are you need to probably keep an eye on, green for things that um, you don't you need to worry about. But you know, there's some other ones already built in here too. Red border, red text, light red. But you always have the option to customize. So I'm going to do custom format, which should launch the format sales dialog box. And so I am going to custom format um, the reorders. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give it bold italic text. And I'm going to set the color to dark green accent five. I know this is dark green accent five because I've done this a bunch of times already, but also because the screen tip tells me. Okay, so of course there are other things you could do. Like I said, there's strike through here. Um, you could change the borders. You could change the background color if you wanted to. Uh, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to change it to the uh, font color that we uh, specified earlier. I'm gonna click OK. And notice that that made that change there. Okay. So that's how you can conditionally format. The OKs we didn't care about, but now when I look at this, my eyes immediately go to this pinkish thing with this red text. Oh, reorder. So I can easily see that I need to reorder these things. Right? All right, so next uh, I am going to select A14 to A78. Again, I'm using the name box because I don't feel like scrolling down to select it. And we're going to do some more conditional formatting. This time we're going to use the data bars because I told you we look at highlight cell rules and data bars today. So the way data bars works is that it uh, puts out a bar chart 
on, on this whole column. So on everything that's selected. And so the way a, a bar chart works is that it looks for the thing that is the highest. So whatever has the max value, which I think is going to be the 47th. Yeah. So the one thing at the top. And it will fill this whole thing with color. Everything else will be filled up to a the fraction um, amount that it is compared to the max. So for instance, this is 48, so this is 32. So 32 is about uh, maybe you could say 75% of the way there. So 75% of this guy is gonna, of this column is, or sorry, of this cell is going to be colored in. 25 is almost halfway, so a little less than half, or a little more than half of this cell is going to be covered in. Two is like nothing, so only a little bit of this is going to be colored in. So that's how data bars work. There are gradient fills. So just so you can get a little preview of this, we're going to do the blue one. There are gradient fills. And what gradient fills do is they get they start off darker and they get lighter as they go. You can do solid fills if you want to as well. They keep the same color all the way. The gradient fills are better in this case because, as I said, it gets lighter as it goes further along. And we have text in these. So it will be easier to view the text on a gradient fill. So as I as you can see, as I said, the bars get filled in based off uh, how much, uh, based off the value here compared to the max. So since 47 is the highest one, it colors this in all the way. I told you 32 should be about half, a uh, 75 percent way through. 25 should be a little more than half. The two should be barely anything. So you guys can see that's how exactly how it fills in that color. So this is nice because it's a very easy way to visualize uh, which is larger. Uh, and what's smaller comparatively without having to do a co uh, column chart or a bar chart to do so. Okay. In fact, personally, I would use a, I would use this as opposed to a bar chart because it's already within it and someone can see directly on top of this information. Okay. All right. Are there any questions about um, any conditional stuff about the count ifs, about the if um, function? about our conditional formatting. Any questions at all in regards to that? No. Okay. So now we're going to look at uh, date time and uh, some freeze pane, which is actually pretty cool. So uh, we're going to go to cell A80. So I'm going to just jump there real quick using the name box. And in A80, I'm going to do equals now. Oops. Equals now. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to know what date time is it right now. So when I do that, it returns to me September 15th, 2020 at 1.30. Oh, I got that right on the dot. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Small victories. Um, but yeah, it returns whatever the time is exactly at that moment. Um, it's not your machine. Okay, so if I had, if I was in a different time zone, you know, this would have given me a different result. If I went through and messed up some things on my computer and changed its time, it would give whatever the time is currently for my machine. Okay. So, can you do that again? Yes, I can. So all I did was, all I did was use the function now. Uh, it's not going to be as clean though. Okay. So all I did was use the function now. So equals, every time you start any formula, you do an equal sign. I'm using the now function. And what that does is it returns the time at this exact moment. So the date and time of this exact moment. That's all it does. Okay. All right. And I'm going to do an autofill here just because so we can make sure we see everything. Yeah, no problem. And that's how the now function works. So it's kind of cool um, to use. I say if you're in your professional world, you would want to do this uh, function um, every time you make a change to something. And the reason I say that is because it's kind of a stamp of, uh, a step for you to be like, okay, the now function was used, and this is the result that, that I got. So this must have been the last time I touched this file. Uh, because there are things that people may do to ma uh, manipulate stuff, but that will allow you to, uh, to have a stamp of approval there to be like, this is the time in which I did something. 
Uh, that would be the reason I would use it. Um, one of my students in the past said that she used it at her job in that way. It was kind of a way for people to sign off that they did something in the time in which they did it. So she could check that herself, be like, okay, you weren't even on the computer this time. Why would you, you know, you, you type that in, you didn't use an out function. Why don't you use an out function like I told you to? Yeah. Um, so that way she could, she was able to kind of keep track of the fact that some of her employees were not being honest uh, about their the work they were doing. Uh, so, all right. Now we're gonna look at how to freeze and unfreeze some uh, some sections of cells. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna do it and then tell you why it might be important to do so. So for instance, right now, look how far we have to scroll up in order to see that each of these columns, uh, the column headers, so we have quantity on hand, item, retail price, so on and so forth. If I was all the way down here, I may forget what that is, right? Like, hmm, Mariner 5 BC extinguisher. What is that? Hmm. I have to go all the way back up here to say, oh, that's an item. That's the name of the item. Um, to kind of help with that, something that you could do is you could do what's known as uh, freeze a pane or freeze a section. And we freeze something, uh, everything above it or before it, Everything before it stays in the same spot, but everything below it, you can scroll on. So uh, give you an example here. Um, I'm gonna go to cell A1, and I am going to, hopefully my screen share window can go away so I can actually get to the view tab. There we go. Okay, and so in the view tab, in the window group, you will notice that there is a section called freeze panes. And what this allows you to do is to decide what you want to freeze on. So if I were to freeze on top row, whatever's on the top row is frozen. You'll even see a kind of a little border here. Now when I scroll up and down, that top row stays the same. I can even go a little past it, but it'll snap back in place. Um, I can unfreeze that. I could freeze the first column if I want to. And that means I can drag things over now that first column will always stay there though. So some of you are probably thinking, oh, I can see how I might be able to use this already, unfreeze panes. But if I really want to use, like in this case, that wasn't really helpful to me. But something I could do is freeze, uh, just use freeze panes. I selected row 14, I'm gonna do freeze panes now. By doing so, I always see as I scroll down, as I said, everything before gets frozen. I can always see my stock statistics and I can always see um, the quantity on hand the entire time as I go down, right? I always see what these column headers are as I move through this. So that's the purpose of freezing panes. Um, it can help you as you're navigating through a sheet. So very helpful if you were say doing a presentation and you needed to freeze those column headers. Like I said, you're moving through a lot of data. Uh, I, I, my homework for myself this week, I have 854 data points to go through. And as I'm going through that, you know, you get down to 300 or something, I may forget what, hey, what what, co what does this column do again? So what I can do is I can freeze the panes at the top so I can know what the column headers are, and then I can scroll through my stuff uh, as I need to. Questions about that? Okay, sweet, sweet, all right. So next, we're finally gonna create a table. I mentioned a couple of times how, yes, this looks like a table. This is probably what you would be used to. If someone told you to make a table with this information, this is probably what you would do. But a table in Excel is so much more powerful and there's so much more that you can do with it. So to make something a table, um, you first need to insert it as a table. So in Excel, uh, I'm going to go to the Home tab. Uh, there it's okay. In the Styles group, you will see there's an option to format something as a table. And it's on the Home tab in the Styles group because this is commonly used within Excel. You also can go to the Insert tab and insert a table in the Tables group. Okay. So that's the way I'm going to do it here. Personally, I'm just gonna be honest with you, I use format as a table. The reason I do that is because I can go ahead and pick the style I want for it off the bat. But for the sake of you all learning what's happening here, we're gonna, I'm gonna do it as uh, insert table. 
Notice that I just had uh, A13 selected, and it automatically assumed that A13 through F78 was the table, which is correct. Remember, Excel is always trying to help you, and so it will use its AI in the background to kind of detect, well, all this data goes into this, to this cell. It goes from where I am now to F78, so I'm going to assume this is the table. Another thing is that uh, my table has headers. It's already checked. Um, notice how we have text here, and then there's differing uh, data underneath it. So it's assuming that the table has headers already, which all of this is true. So it's very helpful um, in this regard. But you would always want to check to make sure this data is correct. That, okay, we are going from A13 to F78. And yes, the table does have headers. So I click OK. And now we have a table in Excel. As you can see, we get these little drop down menus at the top. These allow us to do sorting and filtering off the bat. Um, we also get alternating colors. Um, you can, you can, these are called uh, banded rows. You can do banded columns as, as well. What it does is, is um, the first one will be a darker or a lighter color, and then the um, next one will alternate. So it alternates between dark and lighter colors. Um, in this assignment, we want to actually make the table style medium three. So I'm going to go to the table contextual tabs, on the, uh, go to the design tab, and I'm going to look for uh, medium three. So your medium, third one. I'm going to select that. Again, like I told you all before, we could have in the home tab done format table as and just select the medium three from there, and it would have done all of that for us. It's much faster, and that's why I personally use format as a table instead. Any questions about creating a table? All right. Okay, so um, sort the retail price. So next, we're gonna do is we're. I told you all that we click these drop downs. We get some options for sorting and sorting and filtering, filtering. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna go sort by retail prices. I'm going to click on the retail prices drop down here, and I'm going to sort these values from smallest to largest. So when you do that, it literally will sort it from smallest to largest, and everything else gets reordered as well along with that, because this is seen as one whole record. So this whole row is one whole record, so all of this data goes together. And so if we sort based off just one of the columns or fields here, um, that it will switch around each of those rows. And so that way the data stays together. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna sort the category label from Z to A. So we get our water sports here as you can see. Um, and everything else. I can also do it from A to Z. Notice when I do that, what was under retail price, how that was in order, is now gone. Okay. All right. Okay. Ooh. So, any questions about sorting? Uh, sorting. Okay. So you you can probably see how this could be useful. Um, if I wanted to see which quantities have the lowest amount of items, I could use the sorting to do that. Uh, something else that's cool is you can sort by color. So over here with our conditional formatting, since we have colors here, what we could do is this: we could sort by the cell colors. And it'll put all the things that need to be reordered in the top. So sorting my color can be very useful, especially if you have everything conditionally formatted a certain way. You can use this to come up with your own custom sort by color. Um, I personally use this um, when I'm doing, if I, in my grade book for some of my classes, things are a little different. It's based off of completion of a certain outcome. And so uh, I'll, I'll have it colored 
based off of did you complete this? Okay, give it yellow. If you did not, give it red. Um, and that way I can use sort by color so I can see uh, what outcomes uh, were not were not hit um, by how many students. I can even use that to do some calculations to see what percentage. Uh, so that's how I use it personally in my in my life. Um, you all probably could come up with different ways you would use it as well. So I'm going to turn this back to doing A to Z. Yeah, all right. So that's sorting. Let's look at filtering. So filtering um, um, an Excel table. So we're going to filter the categories by trailering. So the filter, there are a couple of different ways to filter. Um, you can use text filtering. Or this may say number filtering if you have numbers in the column that you're uh, filtering by. And what it does is it allows you to select, uh, are you looking at, does it contain a certain word? Does it equal a certain word? But off the bat, you automatically have everything selected. So if you ever want to look for something specific, you can, you first thing you want to do is unselect everything. And then you could select tra uh, trailering, in this case, on its own, and click OK. So now the only thing we see are um, the rows that had trailering. Notice here that there's a couple of rows bunched up. That's because it's hiding those. So the rows that did not have uh, trailering, it's hiding those from your site. Okay, so filtering is, hide, is really just hiding uh, certain cells from your site. So you can't see them. So if I wanted to, again, I could go back and select them all. I can also filter, let's say, I can, let's say there's a bunch of things here, and I was like, I just need to get trailering. So if I deselect everything and I go to trailering, in trail, as you guys saw, and then press enter, and it only got, because I deselected at the beginning, it only got the selection for things that were um, found when it did the search. So that's another way to do it. All right, so what I want to do now is to see how many items do we have as trailing, trailering. So to figure out that, I could just count this, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you look at the bottom in the status bar, remember the status bar tells you all this, the status of what you currently have. It says we have 10 of 65 records filed. So when it did that filtering, it gave us 10 records. Okay, so we counted it. We got 10. Down here, it tells us we have 10. There's another way to do this as well. I'm going to go back to the design contextual tab. I'm going to go back to the table style options group. And I'm going to select what's known as a total row. And what a total row does is it takes some type of calculation for each column. So I could tell it what I can tell it how to do so. So right now it automatically does count. So it just counts the number of records that are currently being shown. But if I want to truly be more specific about this, what I could do is over here. I could click a drop down and say on the quantity of hand, I want to find the sum of how many items I have on quantity of hand. That means for what's being shown right now, so the 10 uh, trailering items, I have 76 in total of them. All right. So this one counted it. And you can even see that if I click the drop down here, it's on count right now. So that counted the number of records here. I can now look at this and say, take the sum of this, of this column. So this makes it easier for me to get very specific. So like earlier when we did the count if function, I could have actually just made a table, built it for the water sports, and then got the count of it, and that would have made it faster. I'm going to record the amount of uh, trailering items we have. These 76. Uh, well, we have 10 different items, and then I'm going to say we have 76 total products in stock. Maybe we had some big trailering convention coming up, and maybe I just wanted to kind of check to see how many items do I have on hand for trailering stuff. Um, and then I can keep account of how many of the, how many different items there are. So I have 76 products, I have 10 different items. And it's also, I can quickly see, I need to probably reorder some more of these guys. 
All right, so after I'm done with that, I can clear this filter. So I go back to seeing my um, table as I did before. I'm now going to filter this type by towables. I don't see that word directly, so I'm going to go here, do it that way. So I see I have seven different total items. I have 50 of them in total and quantity on hand. Maybe what I want to know is how many of these need to be reordered. So I could filter this for just reordering. And see, I have two items that need to be airhead slide force. And right now I only have five in total. All right, so that's just showing you a couple of different examples you could do. I'm going to clear, clear all these guys. And once I'm done with that, what I can do is I can remove this total row. I'm going to take very, take very close note of what happens when I remove it. So look at it right now. It's on row 79. The now function is on row 80. I am going to remove my total row by going back to the design tab, unchecking total row. It literally deletes that row. And remember when you delete a row, everything that's below it moves up. So the now function that was in A80 is now in um, A79, okay? okay. All right, any questions there? How did you, how, how you did the numbers below? Oh, the total row? So to add a total row, in the, and when you have a table with a, a portion of the table selected, it could be the whole table or just a cell within it, under the design contextual tab in the table styles group, you click on total row. And I'll add those there. You'll add the total row there. And I can change what this does. If I want to look at the uh, average number of quantity items, I could do that here. Um, or let's say I wanted to do. Uh, the sum of quantity items, and I want it to know oops, the average price. This is how I could do that. Do I need? No, you don't need to select all the table in order to add the total row. You just need to have a portion of it selected. That could be the whole thing. That could be a couple of cells. That could just be one cell. I normally just click somewhere in, in the table and then just go up here and do it. Okay. Um, and so some of those things we found earlier with the statistics, right? The average, the median height, uh, medium, the lowest and the highest. I couldn't have done that with the total row, right? Add the total row. There's my average there. There's my min. There's my max. So I could quickly have gotten those from there. I want you to notice too at the top, there's a different a uh, formula that is being created whenever you're using a total row. Notice it says subtotals, then it has a special number here. This number tells it which uh, function to use, and then this tells it which uh, column that you're doing it on, what column to reference it to. So that's something that you really have to worry about, but it's a kind of cool thing to look at. Um, I want something else to notice. As I'm in the table, look what happens to my column headers. As I moved up and down, they automatically become the titles of those columns. So that's another uh, cool reason it's, it is to use a, a table and not just have data just sitting there and say, OK, it looks like a table. Um, by actually making a table, you get this feature. So as you scroll up and down, you automatically know where you're at. And then when you get back to the top of it, that goes away and it returns back to your normal column header. Okay. All right, everything else that was on this uh, scripture lecture, uh, it's pretty simple. It's just uh, working with zo um, the Zoom slider um, and then doing some things with view and split. Everything else you all have already done before, centering the page horizontally, changing the landscape, uh, adding your tags, uh, repeating rows on top, changing the theme. So I won't, I won't go over that because I know you know how to. 
So on Thursday, we will look at scripture lecture uh, for 2B. Um, but this should be enough for you all to get started on 2A and honestly to get started on 2B as well. Because uh, a lot of things that we've done are in the beginnings of 2B. So I have to go because uh, I have another meeting. I do apologize. Um, these meetings will occur every month. I could not see the design option. Um, so when you have the table selected, so something or something in the table selected, you will notice that it appears at the top. Uh, under table tools, you'll get a contextual tab. Just like any other time you insert something, when it's selected, you'll see that contextual tab appear. Okay. All right. Um, got it? Okay, good. Yeah. Just want to make sure you had it. All right. So, um, yeah, if you all, honestly, you could feel free to stay in here if you would like. And you could work with each other on maybe looking at those last parts um, uh, or use your own personal meeting room. It's up to you. When, when I leave, one of you will be made into the host. It should not end the meeting for everyone. Um, so I do, like I said, I do have another meeting to go to now, though. Uh, and I, again, I apologize. This will happen every um, third Tuesday, every month. I try to have a sub. Uh, I've been, it's, it's, it's been harder to get a sub lately because everything's online. So, which is strange to me. I think it should be easier, but is what it is. So, um, yeah, so you all can work on this together if you want, though. I will now stop recording. <laughs>